Welcome into this edition of Riders Block. Ryan Labner, Rex Hoggard. We have new graphics. Hope you guys enjoy it. Shout out to our boy BR, Brian Riley, uh, hooking us up with the new graphics. And Rex, you are not in your Renaissance Inn. I do not see a sink. I do not see a fridge. I do not see some tile backsplash. What's going on? Where are you? I'm actually at PGA West still. Still, The tournament just finished up. Uh, I'm leaving here as soon as we get done with this, sprinting to my car that's 50 yards away and getting on the highway to LAX to try to catch a red eye. Maybe, maybe not. It, that'll be a fun game. It's always a little bit dicey. It's like a two and a half hour drive for those who are not familiar with it. It is uh, could be two a, and a half, could be four and a half. You never you know. Ne you never, you never really know. T T you get out there and you see the you see Line the windmills. It is a it is a great journey. At the end of this show, we are going to give you the best tips for surviving a red eye. I'm actually curious since I'll be surviving one following the the Farmers Insurance Open, which I'm leaving for uh, bright and early on Monday morning. Rex, you just saw it. Hudson Swafford, a uh, now a three time winner on the PGA Tour. Really entertaining back nine. I know a lot of us were caught watching the NFL playoffs, and for good reason, uh, with Matthew Stafford, uh, go Georgia, uh, surviving Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. On the other part of the globe, you had Hudson Swafford making just a single par on the back nine, but that was good enough to win. What were your impressions of Big Hud? Uh, I did the winner's interview for the broadcast, which always makes me a little nervous, keeps me up at night, because you, you only get one or two questions, and you Don't really want them up. to be this. Don't screw it up, man. I mean, you only get one or two, and they, they've really got to be good. So I'm really just stressing about this one. And he actually made it easy to only make one par over your final nine holes. That was four birdies, an eagle, two bogeys, and one par. What were your emotions? That's all I wanted to know. And obviously, there was a lot going on. I mean, he knew that he probably wasn't hitting the ball as well as he wanted to, but he was putting so well. And he figured if he just kept giving himself looks that he would get it done, and, and he did. That was his third PGA Tour victory. And I think from an emotional standpoint, having his son James there by the green, everything that he's gone through, all the work him and John Tillery have put into the swing, I think by far it's the most rewarding. Rex, Georgia stays winning. I mean, Bulldogs win the national championship. Keep coming back to that. Stafford's time. now in the NFC championship game. Big HUD, now his second win at the Amex. You got to love it. It's great to see. Uh, one thing that I did think was notable this week, and there was a lot of talk uh, heading into the tournament, Patrick Cantley, John Rahm uh, dueling once again after really the player of the year uh, debate uh, last fall. Both of them played well at Kapalua and did not get the W. But John Rahm found himself in a little bit of a social media hot water. Rex, I want to get this quote right because he was uh, videoed uh, coming off one of the greens. Right. He called. Are you sure you want to get the quote right? Are you well, sure? He called it a piece of uh, poop uh, setup contest week. He was referring to the setup uh, at the golf course. I was obviously it was a birdie fest. Hudson Swafford won it at 23 under par. Really, the past champions in this event have actually been deeper under par. Patrick Reed even uh, was 30 under par just a couple of years ago. Was Rom's beef legitimate, or was that out of bounds? Well, it was neither. I'm not going to go with either of those. I'm going to state the obvious on both fronts. Apparently, he's the only person that did not know that this was going to be a putting contest. It has always been a putting contest since they played it in 1960 for the first time. He's John won, won this tournament. John, John Rahm yes. is, is a past champion of this event. Of course he knew it was a putting contest. So apparently, he's the only one that didn't know it was a putting contest. But the other half that I, I really wanted to dig in on, and we appreciate this. Everything he went through last summer – and I think we both marveled at it. We both wrote about the idea that somehow he's found a way to control. He can have some anger issues. We've seen it in the past. He can run a little hot on the golf course. We marveled at it, and I think we glossed over the idea that same DNA. He is still the same guy that can run a little hot on the golf course. And that's what we saw. And I'm, I don't want him to change. I never want him to change. The beauty of this is when you ask John about getting mad about a certain shot or a golf course setup, he doesn't understand what you're saying. In his mind, that's just the way things are. That's the way he processes information. It's fine. It's very successful. He's the world number one, but he can still run a little hot. Are you saying that as a central reporter, it, it, first of all, it was your responsibility to go up to John Rahm today after his round and say, John, uh, micro microphone in his face, can you please no offer way. some thoughts on the, on the setup this week? Look, he is always going to uh, be emotional. I think the tantrums are gone, thankfully. That was really what had kind of deterred him in the past and got him a little bit sidetracked. I'm fine with the passion. I'm fine with the fire. I'm fine with him popping off about this. However... There are some little delicacies here why John Rahm is even playing the American Express. This is not a tournament typically you would think that he would want to play. He is uh, uh, represented by Lagardere. That's operational 
uh, of the tournament. That is why John Rahm is playing in the desert. Good players, great players, elite players, such as John Rahm, do not want track meets. They do not want to play birdie fest because their advantage is gone. John Rahm won the U.S. Open because he handled one of the most difficult courses that you're going to find uh, throughout the year on the PGA Tour. And he also executed the shots, which is what you want to have. Anyone can make birdies on the PGA Tour. Anyone can shoot 20 under if their putter gets hot. That's not where you're going to be separating it. John Rahm, uh, to me, that's a that's a fair, criti- fair criticism uh, of the event. He also knew what he was getting into. I think this week at Torrey Ponds, he'll be a little bit sharper. And that's kind of more in the elite players' wheelhouse, a, a tournament that really stresses them out. Moving on, Rex, you had a little bit of news and notes this week following a report from the Daily Mail with Padraig Harrington singing the praises of Luke Donald potentially being the 2023 European Ryder Cup captain. This is about the time of year that we tend to get these decisions from the European side. Have not had that. Probably a couple reasons for that that we can get into. Luke Donald, you had an opportunity to catch up with him over the weekend. What did he say about the potential candidacy uh, next year in Rome? Before I get to that, there's so many layers to this particular onion, isn't there? I mean, we, we look at it and it seems like, okay, Lee Westwood is the obvious next choice, but he has pretty vocally taken himself out of consideration because he still wants to compete and certainly what he did last does year he, on the PGA Tour. Does he or are the Saudi riches coming yes. after him? I don't, I don't even think you know, in his case that's what's going on. I think the bigger deal is with Henrik Stenson because in a lot of people's mind, I think Henrik would have been number two on that list. And that, that's where the Saudi riches start getting involved. Are you going to take the big money and go to the Super League and whatever that's going to turn out to be? Or are you going to take your turn as a Ryder Cup captain? I found this fascinating. Padraig is one of five people on that selection committee. So he is a big voice in that room. He was the previous captain. He is going to be the one that's probably going to be heard the loudest. Luke Donald has served as a vice captain many, many times. Now, he said he was honored. He said he was a little surprised. He said that this is something that he's dreamt about for a long time if he has the opportunity. I, the part that I found fascinating is I also caught up with Graham McGow about this, and Graham pretty much said the same thing that Padraig said. So I think a lot of guys are getting on the same page when it comes to Luke Donald. You, don't, you wouldn't think that Padraig Carrington, the past captain for the European side, part of the five-man committee, you wouldn't think he would actually float his name publicly if this is not going to come to fruition, right? Like, okay, one one member of the five-man panel is floating this name, and then all of a sudden they go yeah. to Robert Carlson or perhaps Henrik Stenson uh, has a has a change of heart, or they go with some completely wild card. It it does make a lot of sense that Luke Donald would be that captain in 2023. Past captain or a past player, obviously extremely successful, part of that a historic team. In organized has a respect for the team. Organized. Yeah. He's, he's been a vice captain of what three? Three or four uh, Ryder Cups previously. Four. 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 Yeah, four is a player, mm-hmm. four is a vice captain. That's right. I think the part that stood out to me, and Graham said this, and I had to think about it, and Graham said he knows how to keep control of a team room. And you don't realize how important that is until you actually get to a Ryder Cup. So I think he's got a lot of things going for him. Luke Donald, you would think on the U.S. side, you might be looking at a Zach Johnson type. Those are two guys who are. Cut from the same cloth, aren't they, Rex? Very similar as players, uh, very astute minds, uh, very thoughtful in their responses. I think both of them would make great captains, and that could actually be one of the more kind of tactical or strategic matchups that we've seen captains-wise. I know they get too much blame for defeats and too much credit probably when they win, but in the lead-up to what is probably going to be a significant home course advantage for the Europeans, uh, I find that very, very interesting. What, who would you give the edge if, if it just so happens to be Luke or Zach? Uh, I would give the edge to, to the Europeans, but not by much because I don't want you coming back around and rubbing this in my face. And, and You're up by poop, four like points, of, I believe, is what you no, said in the podcast I'm not doing year. that, and only because we don't know much about this course in Rome. And if it turns out that they can set that course in Rome up, like they set La Goff National up and to favor the European side and to be such a penalty for the U.S. side, I think that would be telling. All right, so Luke Donald was where you are at the American Express. Perhaps uh, as the uh, presumptive captain for 2023, he was keeping an eye on things in Abu Dhabi where Big Tom Peters, the star of the 2016 Ryder Cup on the European side, uh, got a big victory, I believe his sixth, uh, on what is now known as the DP World Tour. One of the big stories, though, was Rory McIlroy making his 2022 debut, made the cut on the number, slid in about an eight-foot birdie putt on the 36th hole of the week, Ended up backdooring 
uh, a top 10 finish, even had a chance on Sunday, ended up a couple uh, shots off the lead before dropping three shots, coming home. What do you think? Good, bad, ugly, indifferent? What are your thoughts? For doling out grades, I'm usually pretty cool about these things. I'm going to go B minus simply because it's kind of what we've expected from Rory the last few years where he's going to come out a little bit slower. And I'm not talking about his first start of the year. We ran that graphic last week, which is amazing when you look at what he's done in his first start of the year. I'm just talking in general at tournaments. He seems to maybe not have the focus that he needs on a Thursday and Friday. And then once he realizes, oh, I need to make the cut and oh, I need to make a run. I think that's what we saw. 72-75 to open the week 67 69 to close the week and that 69 is a little misguided because he had an opportunity late in the round and probably just started pressing and made some ugly bogeys that he wouldn't have made otherwise if he not been so far behind and we talked about this last week i mean my worry with rory going into the season is he's going to overthink things and we both know that he has a tendency to overthink things and as he's getting older and older it seems like like the rest of us he's getting more and more to to the point that he wants to examine all of these things. And I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing for a golfer. I don't put much stock into what happened at all uh, in Abu Dhabi. The conditions in the second round were hellacious. You'd never see this in the desert. You might see some some windstorms every five years or so, but to have 35 mile an hour winds, 40 mile an hour gusts, and Roy to survive that. It was a it was a scene out of a horror show, and certainly not the way that you want to knock off uh, some holiday rust, which certainly Roy looked like he had you know, over the first couple of days. For him to just get in 72 holes, I think he'll be sharper. He is playing again uh, this week in Dubai, along with Kyle Morikawa, who also had a, a somewhat forgettable week in Abu Dhabi. Rex, I know we got to get out of here. You have a red eye upcoming. You're old. You've been through this drill before. Tell me, what are the secrets? Do you pop pills? Do you get drunk? Do you just ride it out and watch movies? What's your What's your strategy? Two of those things. Yes, two of those three things, I'm <laughs> going to say. This is very, very clear. This is down to a science. And look, anyone who's ever taken a red eye out of LAX knows there's an In-N-Out burger right next to the airport. You stop at In-N-Out. You reward yourself with uh, an In-N-Out burger. I usually get a double animal style. It's very, very good. I do it because I've been in California for seven days, and that's what I deserve. You get to the airport. You have a cocktail or two. Try to limit yourself to two. And then when you get on the plane and this, you need to pay attention. Write this down, laugh. You take one, not two, just one Tylenol PM. Because trust me, you don't want to take two. There's some bad things that end up happening. A shirtless Rex <laughs> Hoggard was seen uh, stumbling through the Orlando airport on it's Monday happened. morning. Uh, you, yeah, also in and out Burger. Uh, pray for the guy who is seated in 11B right next to you. That is the last thing that I want you to be consuming before so uh, boarding a six-hour flight. Rex, I have a red eye next week after Torrey Pines. Never sleep on him. Not even, like, for a couple minutes. It's literally Rookie. just just insomniac. So I'll be coming Come home. On. Uh, like 10 a.m. Uh, to two kids under three. Uh, so that will be terrible. But I am looking forward to getting back on the road, leaving at 5.28 a.m. on Monday to fly to San Diego. Didn't even know that that was possible. Did not know that pre-6 a.m. flights were a thing. But yeah. that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Looking forward to getting back out on the road for the Farmers Insurance Open and Torrey Pines. We'll be doing a special edition of writer's block set your alarms we'll be doing it on tuesday for the wednesday start of the pj tour event this week look forward to seeing you guys there thanks for joining us on this edition we'll talk to you again in like 48 hours